Good morning, Victory. How are we today? Woo, that was the best first time I did that with you guys, the first response that I think we've gotten so far. That was amazing, but I think we do it better. How are we doing today? Awesome, awesome church. So it is my pleasure to welcome you to Sunday service. I'm so happy to have everybody here. If you could go ahead and just do me a quick favor, go ahead and just rise, above, rise, stand, stand, stand. And just say hello to the next person near you. And wait, wait, before you do that, I have something to say, Connor. Don't just say hi to somebody you usually talk to. Say hi to somebody you don't usually talk to. Just say, hey, it's good to see you. Good to have you at church. Go ahead and do that. I will be testing you. Good job, Jim. <laughs> Chase, you can do better. <laughs> Let's keep it going. Keep it going. I love that. Love that. All right, now we can go ahead and start shuffling back to our seats, shuffling back to our seats. And the reason I had everybody do that as you kind of just close out your greetings is because there is something beautiful in Christian fellowship that you can't really get anywhere else in the world. And the reason why I made you talk to somebody you usually don't talk to is because even though you may not be texting each other every day, even though you may not be giving each other a call, you still have that unity because of Christ. And there is love to be shared there. So as we walk into this service, I want you to have that in mind, that each and every single one of us is connected by the love of Jesus Christ. As we go into this service, have that first and foremost in your mind. Now, one thing I want to make a quick little announcement before we get into the proper announcements. We have something special planned right after service today. I would, me and David, we'd love for you to attend and just be behind us in that moment because it's going to be a beautiful time. So right after Sunday service, we have an exciting development that we want to share with everybody within the church. Now, as we go into the proper announcements, first things first is we have our church programs. Right over here, the thing I'm holding, not my phone. You don't get a free phone, I'm sorry. But you get a free program. In the free program, we have a tear-off sheet. In that tear-off sheet, you can go ahead and get plugged into our church community. You can ask for prayer requests. You can go ahead and ask for information regarding small groups. We encourage every single person to fill out that information so that we can pray for you, so we can get behind you, so we can get you plugged in. And when we're talking about being plugged in, that's the next announcement I have. It's going to be small groups. Small groups are starting up again in May. So that's coming up very, very soon. A lot of us are thinking uh, May is like two months away. We're already almost at the end of April. Summer's right around the corner. So let's start the summer season connected and in fellowship together. So we have small groups coming. We're going to have more information soon. However, we do have some small groups that are currently meeting because they're year long. We have our children's ministry. We have our youth ministry led by this guy right over here. And then we also have Spark. All of these are great ways to get plugged in. And one thing you notice is that each one of these ministries are specifically designated for an age group. So you might be thinking, I'm not in high school. I'm not in college. I'm not a child, last time I checked. When I woke up in the mirror, I saw I'm 45 years old. I don't fit any of those demographics. Well, you probably know somebody who does. So I encourage you, go ahead and just reach out to that person. Get them plugged into the appropriate group. It is a great time and a great blessing. Now, one thing I want to go ahead and cover is we have our Monday mornings live with Pastor Dave on Facebook. If you're wondering, what is that? Facebook. I haven't used Facebook in a while. Or I use Facebook all the time. We have a group. Yes, we do have a Facebook group. It's a great way to stay plugged in and stay connected in the fellowship. As you can see, there's a theme behind the announcements today, connection and fellowship. And that's another way you can participate in that. Our Facebook group is available to all those within our service. Please reach out to Pastor Dave or myself or anybody here, and we can go ahead and get you approved and part of that group. That's going to be Monday mornings live streamed at 8 a.m. where Pastor Dave can share some encouragement, share some words of wisdom, share some knowledge regarding the gospel, the truth, so you can get ready and be armed up for that week. Now, if you can't make it at 8 a.m. because I know a lot of us work, that's okay. You can catch the replay right there on that Facebook group. So now, church, as we get ready for worship, have your hearts ready, have your hearts lifted, and be in fellowship. Rise, please. We're going to sing to the Lord. Streams of abundance flow. 
Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will stay. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Woo! Blessed be your name when the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Footsteps and lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very soon, and so you better be believing. That our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. You reign from heaven above. One more time. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. When the sky was starless in the void of the night, our God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and created the light. Judgment and wrath be poured out on Sodom. The mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Sing it. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with me. Don't worry, love our God is an awesome God. Our God is 
an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Thanks, worship team. That was beautiful. Go ahead and take your seats for a minute. We're going to go ahead and, and go to the Lord and, and take communion in just a moment. I just kind of want to set us up to that for that. Um, we're so glad that everyone's here. My name's Dave Lanto. I'm the lead pastor here at Victory. We look forward to a great day. Worship team, you're sounding great. You guys all look great. You guys are ready to <laughs> worship the Lord. And so um, the Lord's Supper is one of the, the, the practices that we do as Christians to help us remember why the, why the faith is important, why we walk with Jesus, why Christianity is a thing. And Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed with his disciples, he took these elements, these simple elements of a dinner, and he gave them a new meaning. As they took the Passover meal, the Jewish Passover, Jesus and his disciples gathered together, and Jesus um, said to his disciples, he took the bread and he took the cup, he said these two elements, and he took a moment to give them new meaning, and that new meaning was to remind him of what he was about to do, what he was about to do. His disciples had no idea about the cross and how that would play out and how important that that would be that when Jesus went to the cross, in one sense, you can think about that as the hinge of all human history. When Jesus went to the cross, all of creation held its breath while Jesus was crucified on the cross because from God's perspective, that was eternity in a snapshot, the meaning of all eternity in that moment. And Jesus, he went to the cross willingly as a sacrifice, and he told his disciples that night before he did it, he said, I want you to do what we're about to do in remembrance of me to remember my death. He wanted his disciples from that day forward to remember the sacrifice that he made, his death on the cross that led to his resurrection. And we just celebrated Easter. That was two weeks ago today that we celebrated Easter. And we celebrate Easter every Sunday is the reason why Christians gather on Sundays is because every Sunday is like Easter where we celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate his death and his resurrection. So in a moment, you're going to be able to come down the middle. The elements of, of communion are set for you here. And um, as you come, take the bread and take the cup and take it with people you're sitting with or go back to your seats or find a corner of the room where you can worship the Lord with communion together. And Jesus wanted us to remember his death because that is the hinge because that is the thing that if Jesus didn't die and then raise, there would be no reason for us to be here today. There would be no Christianity. But Jesus rose. And so we celebrate his death and his resurrection. And we remember what he did for us. And so in a moment, you'll be able to come and take the bread and take the cup. May you have this, these few moments of, of meaningful reflection on the cross to celebrate together. I want to pray for you as you come. Our God and our Father, I pray that you be with your people as we remember your death, Jesus. As we remember that you sacrificed yourself so that we could have freedom from sin. We could be set free from sin. Lord, there's a world that doesn't even know they need to be set free from sin. There's so many people who don't even realize being set free from sin is everything. And so, God, I pray that as we honor you in taking communion right just now, that we would remember your death and remember why you went so that we could have freedom from sin, shame, and death in Christ's name. We practice open communion here at Victory. 
So you can come, if you're a Christian, you're already a believer in Jesus, come and share communion with us. If you haven't yet given your life to Christ or put your faith in Jesus, it's okay to just stay seated um, and while the rest of us take communion. God bless you as you receive the Lord's Supper. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again your family your blood flows through my veins and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God believe that church I'm no longer a slave to fear I am Said I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Sing it out one more time. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God.
scare you at all to be a parent? Nope. Mm. Okay, maybe a little bit. We got this thing outnumbered. It's two grown-ups against one little bitty baby. We got to. Ronnie. His name is Ronnie. When it comes to raising kids, the days are long, but the years are short. Short enough, if you ask me. Tonight, we need to talk about Kate. She was, I guess, hitting other kids in church yesterday. Okay, we'll talk about it. Great. I'm so glad you're interested in your kids' lives. Honey, the only reason that Kate is still here is because she is too young to leave. You know what? This is going nowhere. Sit down! Just leave me alone! And she's falling right after Ronnie. Look me up sometime. Bye, Mom. We have two more coming up after her. She's not your real mom anyway. Your real mom couldn't handle you. And they're gonna follow right after her. Honey, we have got to get help. Our kids aren't the problem. It's us, man. You can't run around living life one day at a time. You gotta know where you're going. And then lead. Here we go. And that will be your legacy. No legacy of faithful love. We just have to remember, our job is to be faithful. Change is up to God. Good morning. If you haven't seen uh, the movie Like Arrows, that's your homework for this week. It's a good, good movie. Go along, right along with this message, too. Um, see, in this world, we have a target. We do. It's the lost souls of men and women. That's our, that's our mission. Our weapons are not for the purpose of killing, but to win them over. It's important that we fight the spiritual battle with the wisdom of God. And God says, our children are like arrows in the hands of a warrior. There are other tools. Our words, they're like arrows. Our actions are like arrows. Our marriages are like arrows. You see, the world is watching. And we can win them over with the love of God. If we shoot those arrows in the right direction. There was a, there was a poem that I used to, when I was a teacher, I taught sixth grade for like 24 years. And uh, we used to study all kinds of things. And I remember studying poetry. And um, if you remember Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, um, the arrow in the song, he goes, I shot an arrow into the air. It fell to earth. I knew not where. For who has sight so keen and strong that it can follow the flight of an arrow? I got off on that one. So, it's, so it says, for so swiftly it flew, who could follow it in its flight? And it goes on to say, I, I sang a song into the air. It fell to earth, I knew not where. Who has sight so keen and strong they can follow the flight of a song? And then it goes on to say, long, long afterward in an oak, I found the arrow still unbroke. And the song I found in the heart of a friend from beginning to end. You know, everything we do has long-lasting consequences, whether it's shooting an arrow haphazardly. How many ever shot an arrow? Yeah? yeah? We used to go to camp and shoot arrows, right? I remember, it's funny, I mean, you get good at it for a while, but when you've never done it before, you, know, you draw back that bow, you don't know how to hold it, and you think you got it aimed right, and you let it go, and it goes, and it just falls to the ground. It's like, oops, you know, what did I do wrong? <laughs> You know, finally you might get it the second time, and it goes flying way over the target, right? Eventually you get it to where you can hit the target, and you have a rhythm going. Uh, but shooting an arrow, 
you have to get the target, right? Um, <clears throat> today's message is from 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. I'm going to go ahead and read that passage. If you'd like to stand, that'd be great. Stand for the reading of God's word. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Verse 2. While they hold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Verse 3. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and wearing of the gold or putting, of, putting on of the apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in, which, in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great, great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own hands, uh, unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to the knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, that as being heirs together of the great grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, a lot to unpack here. Uh, Lord, help me to convey your word in a way that um, speaks truth and is not clouded with uh, per, uh, perceptions that may be uh, misguided or, or wrong. Uh, Lord, this is a difficult passage for many, and especially in our culture today. And I pray that you would uh, honor me as I honor your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. So Peter begins with the word likewise. Now, when you use the word likewise, it's usually talking about something you've already said or just said. Likewise, wives. Likewise what? Right? Well, if you have to go back to the last week's message and talk about what he was saying. Peter has been writing to these uh, exiles to live their lives in such a way so that the world will see their good deeds and will glorify God. They were, Peter was kind of exhorting them to live their lives. Uh, if, if you go back and look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that Whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of salvation. Peter told them to yield to every human authority. He said, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. In other words, obey the law, whether it be to the king as supreme. If you're in a foreign land, you've got to follow the law there. Honor everyone, he says, and, to, and, and yield to our masters who are over us. Uh, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, he says, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. In other words, those that aren't treating you as well as they could. Be a Christian. Man, we need to stand out, right? And how much more if we are just living according to God's word, and being and falling in line with what God wants us to do. 1 Peter 2.15, For so is the will of God, that ye dwell, that, ye, that, ye, that with well-doing ye may be put to silence the ignorance of the foolish men. In other words, when you are blameless, they can't, I mean, they can say a bunch of things about you, but none of them will be founded in any truth. They'll know for sure, you know, I can't talk about this guy, he's He's always doing the right thing, right? They might be looking for things to blame on you, but they can't find anything. Why? Because you're blameless. Now, therefore, Peter is commanding wives to yield also. And this is what verse 1 says. Why? He says, likewise. He says, wives are to be subject to their own husbands. Wives are to yield to their husbands. God's way is wiser than men. You see, we have a target. The world. The world is watching and if we allow God's word to guide us, we can win the world. Maybe not all, but we'll win a lot of them. And you go, well, this, this, this passage is really hard for me. You know, husbands, you know, you have to obey your husbands and all that kind of stuff. 
understand what God's word is saying. Let me try to explain it. We have to have a different behavior. Lifestyle evangelism, evangelism carries itself even to within the home. Now, notice how Peter is, is structuring this, right? He, how he comes off of chapter 2 and goes likewise to wives. He's speaking to a certain type of wife here, right? Um, our holy conduct is not simply when we are outside of our homes, but remains in the home as well. We are evangelists in the home as well as out of the home. We are preachers with our actions and our words in the home as well as out the home, and not just with our actions and our words, but everything about us. Verse 1 pictures a scenario where a wife who has a husband who is not obedient to God, not obedient to God's word, and Peter's instruction is to win the husband over by her conduct. Wives, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. Uh, you're going to be that wife, uh, unlike any other wife found in the world. You are uh, not going to be the one that's always complaining and nagging. Because obviously, there are a lot of guys are worthy or they're well-deserving, I should say, of nagging. You know, even myself, I'm sure, right? I'm not going to stand up here and say I'm perfect. And I probably deserved a lot of nagging and a lot of complaining. Right? But wives, this is, this is to you. You cannot excuse yourself from acting in righteousness and yielding just because he's not acting the way he should. You see, you have a responsibility too. Just because he doesn't act like a Christian does not mean you cannot act like a Christian. In fact, it's all the more important that you do act in a godly way in your marriage, marriage relationship. Now, this, wor this verb, submit... Let me just tell you a little bit about this verb, submit. It comes from the Greek military term, actually. In fact, there's a lot of military uh, terms used uh, in the Bible. You know, all the metaphors and stuff like that, you know, so many of them, right? Put on the whole armor of God, all these things that, you know, you can read throughout the scriptures. There's a lot of metaphors regarding how we ought to behave spiritually as a Christian and they kind of like go along with military terms. Well, this is a military term. It comes from the Greek word, if I can re read this right, uh, hupotasemenoi. I probably didn't pronounce that right, but there you go. You can look it up, right? It means to draw up under. See, wives are not to be passively subservient, but vigorously active. That's what it's about. You see, it's a military term where, think of a, um, a garrison or a military group of people where they're all working together as one, right? That's exactly what it means. You're not waiting for some, him to tell you what to do. That's not what, it, that's not what it's sub, submission is. You're not sitting there waiting for... The sh and this, this, this has been a problem in our culture, right? And sometimes Christians even use this to their defense to be abusive, I'm telling you, that's not the way it's intended. Peter goes on to say, husbands will be won over when they see your respectful and pure conduct. It's a terrible decision for a wife to waver in her faith when a husband is weak or unbelieving. If he doesn't want to obey the, the Lord, wives, well, you need to obey the Lord even more, right? If he doesn't want to go to church, Wives, you need to go to church. You see, you have a higher submission, don't you? Right? If he doesn't want you to serve, you need to serve. You can be respectful, you can be yielding, while maintaining your pure conduct. That's the important part. Think about that. You can still be respectful, you can still be yielding, you can still... Man, you know what? You want him to know that if you're gone, he's going to be hurting. Think of it that way. It's like, let's say you're out there in a battle, you've got your military garrison, and all of a sudden all the troops just flee off into the woods and you're left there standing fighting alone. That wouldn't be a good feeling at all. Now, if the wife 
is doing everything that she wants, that she's supposed to be doing according to God's word, that man will feel like she is precious because he has a lot to lose if he loses her. He has a lot to lose if he loses her. Man, that'll win him over, right? And there's been lots of books written about that. Wives are, are to do good to, uh, for the Lord and to do good for the husbands, even if the husband is not a believer. You see, this is way different behavior, isn't it? This is what stands out. This is what the world sees and says, they'll, they'll look at you and say, why are you like doing that for him? He's like, he's, he's like not even part of, seems like not part of his, he's not doing his part. Why are you doing your part? You know? And uh, wow, what a preaching opportunity you have right there. Why am I doing it? Because the Lord commands me to do it, and I love the Lord. He saved my soul. And I love my husband, too. Wives. And not only will wives have a different behavior as, Christ, as Christian wives, but they will also have a different focus. Their, their whole focus will be different. Peter says not to focus on the externals. See, wives, your beauty should not only be what you look like, but also who you are spiritually. That's the true beauty. That is the true beauty. Your beauty comes from the heart, revealing the quiet and gentle spirit of a Christian wife. Your heart is very valuable to God, and having the character of quietness and gentleness is very precious to God. The word translated gentleness in this passage is the Greek word uh, protes. I don't pronounce that right either, but hey, there it is. Which is uh, commonly described as strength under control. So gentleness is not about weakness. This word here is about controlled strength, right? You know, uh, think of uh, the Rock Johnson, you know, and, and picking up a delicate flower, you know, gentle. It has nothing to do with his strength, does it? I mean, he could grab that flower uh, and rip it to shreds, but he picks it up gently because he's controlled, right? Controlled. It's a trait that's used of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. And it's commanded of all Christians in Matthew 5, verse 5. Do you have that up there? I don't know. Gentleness, or this proutus, a Greek word, describes the person who is in so much in control of himself that he's always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time. And just like Moses, who is praised for being the uh, gentlest or meekest among his contemporaries in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Now, this text has to be taken to an extreme. Some think, uh, or has been taken to an extreme. Some think that is saying that wives are not to focus on their outward beauty at all. That just focus on your inner beauty. No, it doesn't say that, right? The sentence has a but or not but kind of construction. Not only, but also. If you know language, that's the way conjunction works. Not only this, but also this, right? Wives, your adorning should not only be the external, the hair, the jewelry, the clothing. Make yourself pretty, right? After all, when you guys met for the first time, right? Wasn't it physical attraction part of that? Amen. Right? I mean, if they were looking their terrible as they haven't taken a shower in a week, and you're like, hi, I like you, uh, right? <laughs> Wives, it is not a sin to look nice and dress well. And to make your house look nice. You know, too many pillows is not a sin. <laughs> but understand this. Your greatest beauty, your greatest beauty is the internal. Right? Your greatest beauty comes from your godliness. The world emphasizes so much on external. Every TV show, every commercial, it's all about external, right? Social media, you know, it's all about external, what people think about your looks and stuff like that. 
But what matters to God? Your godliness. What makes the difference in your marriage? Your godliness. Husbands, you can help by pointing out what we think about our, spou about our spouses, how beautiful they are, especially point out their godly character. And wives look nice, but don't forget what's very precious in God's sight is your internal. That's the important part. In fact, if you focus on the internal beauty, I believe the external beauty will take care of itself. That's right. So we have a different behavior. We have a different focus, right? A different life model. Holy women in the past uh, placed their hope in God. They also adorned themselves inside and out. They clothed themselves with the yielding attitude that Peter has been commanding all Christians to have. Uh, the example of Sarah in the Old Testament is then used as this uh, godly example, yielding attitude. Sarah is to be a model for the life of the Christian wife. Now, this uh, text is often misunderstood. Why? Because it says, what does Sarah do? Called Abraham what? Lord. Are you going to go around calling your husband Lord? <laughs> I think a lot of this, and a lot of this, when we read the scripture, we've got to take it in because Scripture, as you read Scripture, remember, it's very cultural because of the time of the day, right? The time of the, uh, not the day, but the time of the time, the, the past. Peter's asking them to learn the example of Sarah. Peter's describing the culture of a lost era where wives showed uh, respect to their husbands by calling them Lord or Master. It was not an unusual expression like it might be today. When Jesus addresses this, his mother, he uses the term mother, or actually he says woman. Woman. In John chapter 2, verse 4. We think that Jesus is being rude or impolite when he's called his mother woman. Right? Why? Because our culture, we don't do that. We don't call, hey, woman, bring me... You know, we don't do that kind of stuff. But back then, that was respectful. That was the way the language was. So how can we apply this example and this attitude to today? The point is, it's all about respect, right? It's, all about, it's about respect, having respect for one another. That's, that's the main point right here. Uh, Sarah showed a yielding spirit in her conversation with Abraham, and this fits exactly what the Apostle Paul also taught in Ephesians, Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 33. Nevertheless, let any one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Respect. Right? Especially in public. My gosh. You don't want, you don't want to be doing disrespectful things in public where people can witness you, witness you doing stuff like that. Um, again, our target is to win them over, isn't it? You don't want people to say, yeah, you know, I'd be a Christian except for, you know, I got some Christian neighbors. That's not what I want to do. You know, don't be the excuse for someone who is thinking about being a Christian and saying, ah, I'm not so sure. By doing good, you are the children of Sarah. Even if your husband is not a believer, you are still heirs of the promise if you remain godly and faithful. Verse 6 reminds us that this yielding places the wife in a vulnerable position. She is trusting her husband to act in her best interest, but Peter says that she should not fear anything. She's yielding to the sake of Christ. Do not fear, he says. Do what is right. Don't fear. Just do what is right. Live godly. Have a quiet and gentle spirit. Yield not out of fear or social position, but out of obedience to Christ. Sometimes this involves some really tough love. You got to know what tough love is, right? That's right. Removing yourself and your children from your husband for safety's sake does not mean that you're giving up. 
That's not giving up or saying that you don't support and love him. Some husbands need that kind of wake-up call. It's another misunderstood and tortured text, but uh, if you look at 1 Peter 3, verse 7, it says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to the knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, how is this misunderstood? You can already see how far this is going to be misunderstood. Let's, be, let's, let's kind of clear away some of these false teachings and get to the heart of the matter of this verse. First, notice the word, again, likewise. What does likewise mean? It means, hey, go back, look at what was just said. Husbands, likewise, right? So all that stuff that was said about the wives applies to you too. Get it? That's right. The submission is two-way. What? That's right. If we go back to, even back to 2 Peter, verse 13 and 18, and, and also in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, notice that the theme is what? Yielding, yielding. Husbands are to likewise yield. How? Yield by living with your wives in an understanding way. Husbands, this is certainly a call to living with your wives, living with your wives and treating your wives in an understanding and very considerate way. Are you considering them? How they feel? Husbands, you cannot be harsh with your wives. You cannot be order them around. You cannot tell her what to do. You are not to act like you are the boss. If you do that kind of thing, say, well, the Bible says you're supposed to submit. Uh, you got it wrong, right? You have it wrong. You're not looking at the spirit of what is being told you. You're just taking that one word and you're just kind of leveraging it for your selfish needs. God told the wives to yield to the husband's headship, but God did not tell you husbands to act like their head. You see, you are the two become one, right? Isn't that what marriage is? Um, they're equal. And when God made Adam and Eve, he took from Adam a rib, right? Which is the so right beside him. He didn't take a foot bone. All right? You're to yield by living with your wives in an understanding way. The middle part of this verse also teaches husbands how to yield to their wives. Yield by showing honor as a weaker vessel. Now, careful, read, read those words. It doesn't say that she is a weaker vessel. You're to treat her as if she were a weaker vessel. Huh? Come again? Now, we do know that physical, there's a difference, right? Obviously, when the number 400 swimmer in the male category ch decides to uh, swim in the female category and he wins, that's a, that's a testament to the difference between physical uh, abilities between men and women, right? And you look in the world, all the very physically demanding jobs are primar pri primarily what? Done by men, right? It doesn't mean women can't do them. It, does, it just means that physically there's a difference. That's just bio biology. You can't change that. But we're not talking about physical here, are we? We're talking about what? A spiritual sense. Working together in the home, doing things. Husbands treat them like they're the weaker vessel. In other words, treat them delicately. I'm sure a lot of wives are, 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 can take care of themselves. They don't need you. But you need to treat them like they're precious. Uh, someone gave the example like, um, you know, you're out there the baseball game, you catch, you know, this home run, the 400th home run of whatever, and uh, this ball is like, it just got battered, it's pretty strong, it's not broken, right, but what do you do with it, because it's precious, you treat it like what, oh man, this is so precious, you put it in a glass case, you take care of it, right, not because the ball is weak in any sort of way, but because it's precious, and you take care of it as if 
they were very uh, delicate. Show her honor like a precious, delicate vessel. Treat her with respect. She's not inferior. In fact, Peter goes on to make that very point. She's a fellow heir of the grace of God. Treat her as equal, this pursuit of God. She is heir with you, not a slave under you. Now we're going through this and we're learning stuff about what God wants us to behave like. Right? And the last part of this passage says that your prayers be not hindered. When husbands, when you're treating your wives with honor, and, and if you're not living with her in, in uh, compassion, if you're not treating her with honor, you're not living with her in compassion and understanding way, and when you're not showing her honor as a fellow heir with you, guess what? Your prayers are blocked. You think you're going to be all holy and pray at the same time? You're, you're not following God's word here. You see, we need to clear our souls and our hearts of sin and come to God and know that we're right with God. And it starts here. This mutual love and respect is a teamwork. It makes a godly marriage. One that targets the world and wins over those lost souls. And your children are part of that plan too. Psalm 20, 127, verse 3 and 5. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty warrior, so children are of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. You have your quiver full of those little kids. The more the merrier, right? And they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. If you have, God, if you have a godly marriage, if your marriage is godly, you're doing the right thing, your children will grow up and be just like those arrows, the arrows that fly into the world, right? And with all the influence and love of God's message, they will hit their target, and they will change this world for God. That's what you want them to do. You don't want to release a pack of devils. You think that's going to help? You want to release a pack of arrows that are targeted, right? Right? Proverbs 22.6, uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, you can disagree with me or disagree with this message, but if you do, you need to take it up with God. This is God's word. God wants his word to be not only in your hearts. God's, he, God wants his word to be in your lives and in your children's lives and in your children's hearts. He wants God, his word to be embedded not just in your head, but in your hearts and in your lives as you live out. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9. And these words which I commanded thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk with them, and shalt talk with them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. You know what? I've been to some houses where there's God's word is like plastered everywhere. Amen to that, right? But it's not just the fact that they have God's word posted. It's not just God's word on a sign or on a, a picture frame or here. It's in their hearts as well. Everywhere. God's word should be permeated in your home. And it's not on the screen, but if you continue reading past verse 7, finally, be of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. We need to make a difference in this world. It starts with our marriages. It starts with our marriages. It really does. It flows into our kids, and as we shoot them off into the world like arrows... They make a difference. They make a difference in the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance. And Lord, help us to follow your word and to make a difference as we fight the spiritual battle and as we fight to win the souls of lost men and women. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, stay tuned. We have something special coming up.
Thank you, Jim. This next song, I will rise. The first verse is, there's a peace I've come to know, though my heart and flesh may fail. There's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. There's another line that talks about how Jesus overcomes. This world has tough stuff, right? Where it's filled with imperfect people, and because of sin, lots of things happen to the earth, too. But the good news is that there's hope in Jesus and that he is the anchor. And even when I am weak, he is strong. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand and sing this next song. There's a peace I've come to know, though my heart and flesh may fail. There's a anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome. And the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. Amen. He is risen from the dead. And I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow. No
Thank you. That was a beautiful song. Is that the first time we did that song? I like that. That was a good song. You guys can go ahead and take your seats. We're going to go ahead and take our offering right now. So in our, in our church, we also practice the offering. And in our pra- church, we practice the tithe, which is we give back 10% back to the Lord. And we just want to invite you um, to give right now. There's, there's two ways you can give, either online through our secure platform at victoryanaheim.org slash donate. Uh, or you can do the giving boxes in the back of the room, the little black box. And we are thankful to give back to the Lord. Um, giving is one of the practices of the Christian life that literally puts your money where your mouth is. I have faith in Jesus. I give back to the Lord. And it's the only place in the Bible that the Lord says, well, test me and see that I'll provide for you. You start giving. If you go to our website, you see we, when you click on donate, there's what we call the 90-day giving challenge that if you haven't started giving yet, we invite you to take the 90-day giving challenge where you start giving for 90 days and watch how the Lord provides for you. The Lord is good. We're thankful to be together to worship Him. And I have the blessing today to do one of the coolest things in pastoral ministry. Um, when I got into, into pastoral ministry, it was, it was because I love getting behind people and helping them give their whole lives to God, helping them learn what it means to follow Jesus and to live that out in every way throughout their lives. And so we have the honor today of being able to call up David and Morgan right now. If you guys will come up and I'm going to ask our church board to also come forward. Our church board members, if you can come forward, would appreciate that. These two young men, young leaders in our church, have, have given their lives to God, and they've, they've um, served the Lord. They've, in our church, they've both volunteered and led ministries and led in faithfulness and lived faithful lives to the Lord. And there's, if you look at the Christian life, there's steps that you take along the way. And these guys have, have, have come to a place of both loyalty to the Lord, dedication to God, and service to Him. And they've gone through a, a training period over the last year and a half. Uh, where they have, have, have gone through a course of study and preparation for ministry. And it started by about two years ago, these guys both came to me separately and said, I believe that God's doing something in me. I believe that God's drawing me to a deeper level, and I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> what should I do next? And we started this internship program that these guys have met with me every Saturday or most Saturdays and Friday nights over the last year and a half is in their, in their training. Uh, David said he, he's read more books in that year and a half than he read in his whole life before that. True. <laughs> Going through college and school and everything. Um, our, our, our church board is standing here because these are the, 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 the deacons and the trustees of our church, and we want to stand behind these two men as they take a step in, in, in take this step in their lives with God. And I'm going to read a scripture that David and, and Morgan, I'm going to read this scripture um, as a charge to you, all right? And so this, this is from, from the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. One verse, it says this, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. This is a message written to young leaders in the church. The Apostle Paul wrote this specifically to Timothy. And the reason why examples are important is because we need a picture of what we're aiming for. We need a vision for the kind of life that we aspire to live in Christ. And you too, and, and our, our congregation as you're, and folks online as you're involved or here to witness this, 
their journey has, has, has kind of brought them to this point. And we want to recognize their achievements in their life with God, in their discipleship process in both of these men. And as young leaders in the church, you have a high calling and a responsibility to form your hearts, your minds, your spirits, your bodies in the way of Jesus. You are men of God and you're called out from among your generation to lead in Jesus' name. So Paul said to Timothy, be an example in word. Your words that come out of your mouth, are they matter because you are examples. And so let no words come out of your mouth that drag other people down. May your words only uplift everyone who hears your words. Your conduct is important because it's the way you live your life. What you do, who you surround yourself with, what is important to you, Morgan and David, should all be with intention and never by accident. None of your conduct by accident as men of God. Conduct yourselves in such a way that your life is aspirational to the rest of us in the church. That we say we want to be like Morgan. We want to be like David in the way they live their lives. Your love life matters. Paul says to Timothy, be an example in love. Your love life matters because God is love. Your love life, I'm not talking about romance. And that's not what Paul is talking about here. Love is much more in-depth than romance. Although that's the way you love your wife was important. Jim gave us a message about that. Your love life begins with properly loving yourself. Properly loving yourself. Jesus said, love others as much as you love yourself. Jesus knows it's important for us to properly love ourselves. So love yourself, your emotional health, your spiritual health, your intellectual health, your physical health. All are important. The way you love yourself in such a way that you take good care of yourself in these ways. But also, Jesus calls us to love other people in the same way that we love ourselves. Take care of their well-being, just like you take care of your own well-being. Your faith matters. Paul said, be an example in the faith. Be an example in the faith because the world is dark. The world is dark and people are trapped in sin. Let your life shine with faith in Jesus and hope. The hope that comes from faith in Jesus. So live your life in such a way that faith is an example and a call and something that we aspire to, the faith we see in you. Your purity matters. The last thing that Paul said to Timothy, be an example to other believers in your purity. Your purity matters because Christ already set you free from sin. And he paid the price on the cross for your sin. So because he paid the price for your sin, sin no more. Your purity matters. Live a life that this is a calling that every believer has to live a pure life. And this is your calling in Christ's name. The, the, it's a discipline to set yourself out apart in purity. I want to give you one other scripture. I'm not going to read the scripture, but Jesus tells us in Matthew 20 and verse 26 that Greatness in God's kingdom comes through serving. From Jesus, we learn, from his example, we learn that the greatest act of leadership is being a servant leader. Leaders are called to serve those that they would lead. And I want to give you guys that, 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 that thought because that's the way you lead, through serving. Be the first to serve. Be the first to show up and the last to leave. Be the first one to love. Be the first one to help others. Don't wait for others. You lead the way. And so leaders lead by serving. The most effective leadership is servant leadership. 
serving those under your care. We live in a world where leaders impose their demands on people, but Jesus calls us to a different way. We influence through serving. We gain trust through serving. So we have two gifts. William, if you wouldn't mind, William and Jim, if you could each grab a set of gifts that we have for, for you guys to recognize your accomplishments on your journey. And both these gifts, may have one set. Both of these gifts are resources that we want to put in your hands, okay? That we want to put these resources in your hands because the first thing is that I want to give to each of you the ESV study Bible. Um, it's the same Bible I, I preach out of, and um, I want to give you this, this um, for yourself because every preacher needs a good preaching Bible. And so now you have the best preaching Bible. This is a seriously, no joke. There's a message in the early pages in there that I've written to each of you guys. So I didn't mark them. So if you have David's, make sure you switch with him. You can open it up and see who's, make sure you have the right one. You got the right one? You got it right. Wow. Look at that. Unless Morgan calls you dad. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the second thing I want to give you, this is a contemporary handbook for weddings and funerals and other occasions that every preacher needs a resource like this to help you guys um, plan to do weddings and plan to do funerals and all the, all the occasions that a pastor would lead. They're, they're in there. It's a resource to you guys to help you along the way. Gentlemen, this is, this is a, a momentous day for you in your life, and it's a treat for me to have, have, have been um, leading you the way in, along the way. It's been a blessing. You know, I've been leading you along the way for a long time, David. Um, and on, I want to say here is with, with our board, the the, with the blessing of the board and, and the support of our board, on this 23rd day of April, in the year of our Lord, 2023, we as the deacons, trustees, and leaders of Victory Anaheim do hereby license David Lanto III and Andrew Morgan, Andrew Morgan Morgan, <laughs> to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. As the Lord leads you, be servants who lead. Be bold to speak words of life. Be diligent in your study of the word. Be blessed by the power and the love of Jesus. Board, will you gather around as I just say a prayer on these guys? Our God and our Father, we bless these two young men as they dedicate themselves to you, as they take steps, this isn't about the dedicating themselves to the church. This is about dedicating themselves to Jesus Christ. Amen. This is about a calling placed on them by the Lord himself. This is about seeking him with all their hearts, lives, with all their minds, with all their soul, with all their strength. Lord, I pray that you would protect them. Protect Morgan. Protect David. Guide them. Lead their steps. May they be drawn toward righteousness, goodness. Lord, I pray that you would cultivate in, in them the fruits of the Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would empower them to speak boldly, to not be afraid or ashamed to speak the gospel, but that they would speak boldly out of love for you and dedication to you. Bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen. I present to you these two young men licensed to preach from this day forward. Hey. Oh, we want a picture. No hiding. Do we have Jock hiding back here? Get over here, Jock. <laughs> Okay, Mom, you're all right. Okay, one, two, three. One, two, three. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Doc, is Henry? Is he ready to get on my side? Grow taller. Too late. All right. One, two, three. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So we have refreshments out there for everyone. We're so thankful for everyone to be out, be here with us. We love you guys. Um, it's been a great day to be together. Go have some refreshments. We have cakes out there. There's a cake with Morgan's name and a cake with David's name, congratulating them both. Make sure, Morgan and David, you guys get out there right away so people can start hugging you guys and giving you guys high fives and blessing you guys. All right, be blessed in the name of the Lord, G Church. Jesus is with you.